Multi-camera television directing has almost become a lost art. Early in my career, there was multi-camera shows everywhere. Primetime television was filled with them. They were concert specials, multi-camera sitcoms, all kind of specials, Johnny Cash special, Glenn Campbell, people like that. But today, you don't see it so much unless it's maybe the Oscars or the Grammys or game shows or the occasional concert. But today, we're going to talk with Clay Jacobson, who has spent his career doing multi-camera television on a variety of shows and a variety of formats, who's going to explain to us how that world works and how's there's, how there's still a place out there for a really talented multi-camera director. Clay Jacobson, welcome. Well, thank you so you much. You know, thanks for being on this episode. Early, super early in our career, we both worked together. You did. And uh, then we went separate ways, and you've done the multi-camera thing ever since then. And, I mean, let me let me just read you a few of the credits. I mean, he's done the Jerry Lewis Telethon for six years, which was a huge... I mean, I, how many hours were you on that at a time? 21 and a half live. Directing multi-camera right. show, 21 and a half hours. I mean, it's really <laughs> remarkable. He's done, he's worked with Merv Griffith, Dolly Parton, Tim McGraw, I mean, Kermit the Frog, you name it, he's directed. And he's done all kind of interview shows, concert specials. Today he's working, he's directing Jeopardy Correct. on the set over at Sony. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, um, first of all, let's start with your career. How did you get into this whole thing? You went to college and studied. Yeah, we both went to Oral Roberts University. Yep. You. Amazing. I love your story because you talked about how you were there for another reason, yeah. your film thing, and it made people talk, and you got into this thing about storytelling. Yeah. I've never wanted to be a storyteller. <laughs> I wanted to be an event coverer. Yeah. You know, when I, when I was well, that's an interesting distinction, actually. It is a distinction. For multi-camera directing, you're not creating a story. You're yeah. generally covering something. You're capturing the capturing story. Capturing something, exactly. But when I was 15, I went to ABC. Yeah. We lived in a farm up in Fresno area, the Great Branch. Oh, wow. And uh, my parents and I went to LA for vacation. I went to a game show at ABC called Split Second. They gave away a car. And I was so fascinated by the crane camera, by the behind the scenes <laughs> stuff. I, I, yeah. wanna, I wanna do that. I was 15. Most people thought, you know, oh, he's gonna be a doctor, lawyer, whatever, that kind yeah. of stuff. Uh, no, I, no, I had, no, I had television. no, no yeah. potential for that. But for no me. film. I, I wasn't interested in film. I was interested in the multi-camera live event kind of thing. Didn't know what to do about that, but two of my brothers went to Old Roberts University to be pastors. I know I didn't want that. <laughs> but I knew that the students did the TV show. Okay. And so I chose ORU to get the degree, and number two, to get the experience. And it worked out really well. Very interesting. Well, you know, it's funny that uh, people assume sometimes that you're just kind of you know, capturing this event, but the truth is, you're also interpreting it for a television audience, like basketball. You know, we both worked on basketball games, college, mm -hmm. directing college basketball games back in our 20s, and um, it's not just setting up four cameras and randomly cutting between them. You're trying to make that a, a compelling experience for somebody watching on a glass box at home a right. thousand miles away. And so whether it's a game show or whether it's a, a sporting event or a concert, you're actually doing more than just you know, capturing it, you're actually interpreting it and taking it to a whole other level for, for a television audience. The way I distinguish a film director will is telling a story. So he or she will yeah. give the viewer what they want the viewer to see. Okay. A multi-camera director's job to me is more giving the viewer what they want, not what I want them to see. So oh. if, if it's a sporting event, obviously you got to cover the gameplay. Right. That's an obvious thing. As soon as a play is over, you're doing the color, you're doing the inserts, the emotion, the drama. Um, on a game show. My main goal as a director of Jeopardy is to make sure the home audience can play the game. Oh, interesting. They won't come back and watch if they're not able to play the game. So the way the game is played, I haven't changed at all. That's sacrosanct. But yeah. how we get in and out of that has kind of put my own personality on that as I've taken over directing this last season. Oh, very That's interesting. So, yeah. and, and let me, and for what it's worth, although you structure a show, you have a, de uh, you know, you have a rundown, you give cameramen assignments and stuff. Very often, there, there's a lot of improvisation. You know, you're improvising a lot. Like Jerry Lewis, you didn't know what he's, I mean, he, theoretically, you knew what he was supposed to do. <laughs> no, no. But he could know. be off and do anything. No, with Jerry, it was, if you got too good, if the show was looking too slick in his mind, yeah. he would ring the, I had a phone in front of me that his voice would activate if he wanted to pick it up. I'm going out on stage, this looks too good. And then he would go mess up whatever was going on so that we look live. <laughs> 
<laughs> I think there's something to be said for that. I had that happen to me. I did a, a big, big project with a bunch of interviews with people years ago for the Republican National Convention, the television broadcast of the, the Republican Convention, and they wanted me to interview a bunch of delegates that, had, you know, a school teacher in Iowa and a policeman from Atlanta and, and an insurance salesman from Dallas and like eight or nine interviews. And they said, shoot these people's stories about what their life is like and, you know, why they're coming to the convention. And um, so I thought, man, this is going to be big. This is going to be a huge national TV audience. I better make these look amazing. So we put a lot of effort into them. I took them to New York, play them for the big advertising mucky mucks there. And they all said, these look fantastic. These are really great, but we can't use them. And I said, why? And they said, because they're too slick. They're done too well. <laughs> they said, go back and screw up a shot, make something out of focus, you know, make it look real. And so we did. I've, since then, I've become a master at screwing things up. <laughs> but uh, I learned early on that that... There's a certain level of authenticity and, and being real that's not about being perfect. That's a little bit too far. And apparently Jerry understood that. Jerry, well, he wanted to be the center of it all, too, which makes it <laughs> all part of that. Yeah. But a funny Jerry Lewis story. My first year directing the show, I had been camera operator, technical director, technical supervisor for 12 years. Okay. And about the 13th year. He called me at my house one day, totally shocked me. He said, you're directing this year. I said, you got to be kidding. What, you know, like you said, 21 and a half hours in your introduction. <laughs> that was so daunting. But I kind of learned to look at it as 21 45 minute specials and break wow. it down. And yeah. then it was able to become not such this big monster. But the very first day I'm rehearsing the opening number, we have 20 dancers on stage. We're at the Cerro Hotel in Las Vegas. I'm a golf cart ride away from the stage, being downstairs and into the street, plus yeah. another half a mile to get to the production office. And we have, everything's going, everything's happening. All of a sudden, I get a phone call. Jerry wants to see you in the office right now. I said, okay. <laughs> so, take five. Everybody stopped on stage. I got my golf cart, went up there. Walked into his office, in, you know, big production office. And this is where I was like, you really have to sense when God's trying to impress you. You better know yes. what the Holy Spirit's saying to you. This was one of those moments. But we sat, I sat in front of his desk. He took the, the our script binders for a 21-hour show was two four-inch binders. Oh, my god! Completely full. He grabbed those two binders. He slapped him in front of me on the desk and didn't say a word. And I'm still going, <laughs> okay, this is a test. <laughs> God, what am I supposed to yeah. And it was just the Holy Spirit said, okay, just do this. So I said, Jerry, you're looking at these big binders, and you're thinking during the 21 hours, I'm going to be watching this and not you. I said, somebody have a rundown? Give me a rundown. So they gave me, you know, the rundown for that 21 hours is like that. It's just yes. a, a point by point, what's going to happen and what order and what part of the stage and stuff. I said, see this rundown? I'm watching you and this. My AD is watching all that. Oh, that's good. And he said, he didn't say anything. Actually, he said, okay, go back to rehearsal. <laughs> that <was> really, <laughs> that's good. So part of understanding our role as a multi-camera director is understanding the personalities, who yeah. you're dealing with, having the right answer. The way to get Jerry to do what I wanted him to do was to have it come out of his mouth, that that's what he wanted to do. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Well, because if it comes out of his mouth, he's going to be more passionate about it anyway. Sure. It was his idea. That's right. Even if it was mine original. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. We've talked a lot on, on, on the, you know, these episodes about leadership skills when it comes to sure. directing or producing. And the fact that I'm a big believer that you're a, you know, you, your people skills are just as important as the skills it takes to do your job. Sure. So as a director, a multi-camera director, I mean, you're dealing with a, a huge crew, not only camera operators, yeah. but video people and switch. You know, there's just a ton of people on the set. Um, why, how important is it to be a leader, be a clear leader, and really be able to inspire your crew? That's important, but also it's important to get the right people around you. Oh, Because okay. I've always said uh, a multi-camera director who is really, really good at his job but has a terrible crew generally have a really bad product. Okay. A director who may not be the best, actually could be pretty bad, yeah. gets the A-team crew together, he looks sharp and knows what Amazing. he's doing. So that's the first thing. Get the right people around you that you can trust. But yeah, you are intimately involved, more probably with the camera people more than anything else. Okay. And it really helped me coming from a cameraman's perspective. That's what I did first right. with you at ORU, then into technical directing, finally directing. So I know how to speak Cameronese. Cameronese? Cameronese. the right word. That <laughs> works. Um, the language but, of the But camera. you're also working with lighting directors, set people, makeup, hair. Yeah. I mean, all of these elements that they're all department heads, they all know what they're doing. But the final say comes back to you, you know, when, when there's something going on. So it, it's it's an intricate process, but fun. It is it's a great way <laughs> to make a living. Well, you've done the Dub Awards, American Idol, Ellen, Entertainment Tonight. What What's the 
most number of cameras you've directed at one time on a show? Do you oh, remember? That's a good question. Um, probably about 12. On 12? A on a race or something. So you're event, talking, yeah. let, let's just visualize this. For people that have never directed multi-camera shows before, you're talking to 12 people. That's just the camera operators. That's not the technical yeah. director, the assistant director, other people, the lighting director. You're talking 12 people, and you're working the show. Um, I discovered, one of the things I learned early on was never look at the program monitor. That's a good point. Because That's you've good. taken that shot. There's nothing you can do about that. It's done. You also, you should be looking at the, the, the preview monitor. So you're really having conversations one, two, three shots yeah. ahead all yeah. the time, right? If you're, if you're looking at the program monitor, you're watching the show and you're behind. Okay. That's good. basically it. You, know, That's you see something happen there, go, oh, what? I have nightmares at night. That I'm directing a show and all of the camera monitors have gone black and you can't see it. And so you have to guess <laughs> who's got what angle. It's hilarious, but you are not even watching the preset because that's yeah. what the TV could give you. Okay. I'm, I'm watching all 12. What everybody's doing. Like on there. Jeopardy, it's six cameras. Okay. It depends on what it is, but that's where you are. your eyes need to be focused and you need to be a step or two ahead of what's happening next so that you're ready to go. And how does an AD work with you, assistant director? Depends on the show. Um, assistant director's usually in charge of, of timing the show. Um, if it's a musical number, like there's, there's three different ways to do a musical number. There's completely shot block it out, yep. where shot, usually we start with the shot number, not one, but whatever... If you have seven cameras, we start with shot eight. So okay. there's no confusion on uh, so, okay. like shot eight's on one, shot nine's on two, shot oh, ten's on three. And you have blocked out the musical number to precisely what you want where. And the AD will call all those readies, and then you're snapping your finger, however you cue it, you want it at the moment you want the camera to be taken. There's also just total ad lib. Yep. Most rappers, you can't shot block. You have to ad lib. <laughs> um, and then there's a combination of the two. Like on the telethon, we would rehearse numbers days before they ever came into the show and okay. did their stuff on the air. So often with, without the singer, the star, whoever, you just, with the star, no, oh, they would the come star. in They'd and come rehearse. in early and do it. Okay. Yeah, but I mean, it was rehearsed on Friday, it rehearsed on Saturday, but your show Sunday afternoon, evening okay. through Monday afternoon. Um, so we would hardly ever shot block that. Um, we did one number. I remember we did um, Beauty and the Beast. They came in and did their product, you know, full on stage yes. deal and stuff with Gaston singing, you know. And, and so we shot block that in its entirety. But then we had to make sure that the people that rehearsed it were actually on camera on that hour. Because <laughs> That's true. Because you have two different crews, you have, you have subs yeah. rotating in and stuff. So I made sure, okay, this shot, this number. Yeah. And, and it's on my website if people go to ClayJacobson.com. You can actually watch that video. ClayJacobson.com, go check it out. Yeah, and it was just, it, it went flawlessly. And this was like the, wow. the, the 20, 20th hour of the telephone. So after 20 hours of live, we had this shot blocked out <laughs> I'd number. I'd be punch drunk at that <laughs> we moment. We were all punch drunk. But that four minutes, it was just flawless. It was hilarious. We all wow. laughed afterwards. It went well. So, so have you ever been in a situation? Now, live live is a whole different experience in many ways. than Like when you're doing Jeopardy, you're shooting how far ahead? You're shooting months ahead? I can't divulge that. Okay, sorry. You'd have to kill me. Um, <laughs> but with live live... I mean, every mistake happens. There's no fixing it. It's it. gone. It's, it's gone. In the, it's in the universe. So yeah. there's got to be a certain amount of tension there. Uh, adrenaline. Adrenaline. That's yeah. good. But good adrenaline. It's like... The good thing for me is when you do go to black at the end, you're done. No post. No post. You no, walk yeah. away. What well, can I fix that? How do I do yeah. this? Can we make this look better? We did a live thing for Jeopardy last fall because we had oh. a team tournament where we had captains come out and draft their teammates. Oh. And so we did on Facebook Live. Um, these captains drafting their players. And it was, you know, Alex hasn't done live in I don't know how many years. Yeah. You know, I have. Alex Trebek. A lot of our, thank you, a lot of our crew had, but none of the producers or the staff, they do Jeopardy. They don't do live television. That's funny. And it was funny to watch the stress and the <laughs> angst. And I remember 30 minutes before we went live, I'm sitting on the stage and, and one of the producers comes up, sits next to me and we're talking. I go, you see this feeling? She goes, what? I go, this is what it feels like when you've done everything you can do Nothing else can be done. You're just waiting for the clock to hit the right time to go live. That's goes, really funny. This is weird. I go, Why are you so relaxed? I said, because it's in God's yeah. hands now. Yeah, I mean, it's some stupid guy. Yeah. But the only critique I got of that live event, our producer, executive producer, came up to me later and says, everybody's thinking that wasn't live. It was too slick. Really? Well, that's a good criticism. <laughs> no, they wanted it to be a little. That's funny. That's fine. Well, you know, it is interesting to me that there's always going to be a place for live programming, whether sure. it's a news event, whether it's a concert or what a timely thing like your, your Facebook deal. I, I just think that there, there's something about the adrenaline and excitement of people knowing. And it's why I think we've seen the networks recently do some musicals uh, in prime time live, live. Yeah. And, um, and what's I think interesting about those people love that. Is, is you talk about a multi-camera director. Those 
always have had two directors now. There's a, this new phase going on where Grease, um, Sound of Music, yeah. they had a theatrical director who came in and handled the blocking. Handled, directed the actors. Directed the actors. Okay. And then they had the multi-camera director who came in and directed the cameras and stuff. And I've heard you say before, you didn't have the information to talk to actors in the language right. they would understand. I've, I've had the same limitation in my career because I'm I didn't direct sitcoms. I TD'd a few. Um, but I could see that if I ever had to, I would be lacking in how to tell an actor or an actress yeah. to get the performance you would want out of them and stuff. So this new wave has happened, and it's worked really well. You have two directors doing two different functions. And they have to translate. I mean, you do have to work together because sure. you want your close-up here, and, and it, so the actor's got to be there at that moment. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, some of the Christian stuff that we see out there. You know, a lot of multi-camera directors. It's interesting that simply because... We don't see as many multi-camera shows, particularly in prime time anymore. Uh, and when you do, they're ISO'd. It's almost like individual cameras do it, doing it, like film style. Right. And so we have a generation of people that have grown up with single cameras you, on YouTube and, and things like that. And I don't see as many people that have been that experienced or had that much opportunity to grow and learn about multi-camera directing. So what happens is you get in a church and they're getting ready to do their Christmas pageant or they're getting ready to do their Easter pageant or they're doing some big worship concert concert and these guys uh, these men and women who are directing are completely lost they don't know what to do give me a couple tips what would you do to encourage someone um, you know one of the things I know you're big about in fact you wrote uh, a, a column on my blog about the difference between directing for an audience and directing the IMAG screens right. uh, what are some of the tips you'd give to guys at a church setting directing in that kind of environment I think one thing to know first off is we are all directors you know, you're a director, yeah. obviously, but I'm talking about the normal person anywhere. If you go to a concert, you are directing what you see. That's true. You don't realize it, yeah. but your eyes, whatever your eyes focused on, that's the camera, that's the camera. you've chosen. Whether you're watching the lead singer, you're watching the guitar player, you're watching your iPhone. I mean, yeah. you think about a church setting. Now we're in, we're in a, a sermon set. Let's say the sermon situation first, and you've got the pastor up there. Everybody's their own director before you even do IMAX. They're watching the pastor. They're looking, oh, what's going on with this? Oh, wow, oh, there's a verse. I, I can read my Bible or yeah. I can read Facebook during yes. the sermon. You know, all sorts of distractions yeah. can be going on. And when you add IMAG to your church service, basically you've added one more distraction for the person in the audience to be distracted. With. So their eye could go from the pastor to the thing to this thing. And that could be IMAG, which is image magnification that's yeah. a good thing the big screen yeah the big screen. if you're far in the back of a big auditorium and you when you look down at the pastor you're seeing him maybe that side yeah, but you look over the screen bit. and you got the way shot you can get more intimate with the pastor and understand things so now if that screen goes to a wide shot and you can see your pastor this tall, but on the screen he's this tall. What good is that? Yeah, if you're, that is absolutely if you're sitting worthless. in the back row and already s <laughs> yeah. see a wide shot. You've got your wide shot. <laughs> yes. You don't need it. And, and what I think people in ministry forget, and when they're in this little room and they're yeah. in a cubby hole, and, and they're thinking that they're doing a multi-camera direction for people watching a screen. That's wrong. you got to stop that right away. Your audience has their wide shot. They can self-direct everything they're seeing on stage already. What you need to be doing is focusing on how can I best help my pastor get the point across? And I, I used, you know, the do's and don'ts we talked about. Now yes. here, I kind of laid off that a little bit and said, you know what? You need to follow the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and that's harder than any other job you can yeah. think of the do's and don'ts. But, you know, our eyes can blink away if we get bored. We can look over here yeah. for a second if we get bored. But if you're constantly switching this signal over there on the screen, your eyes are going to go. You know, if you're, yeah. at a, if you're at a sports bar or a restaurant and there's screens, I am the worst conversationalist because my eyes yeah, go to video. Screen. And, oh, hey, look at that. You know, it's, you know, so don't distract. Well, That's it's, the also, thing. it's also ruined audience shots because suddenly people aren't looking at the speaker anymore. They're looking up at this screen <laughs> off to the side. It's weird. Yeah, how much it be for a speaker to yeah. have your people in your front row and looking they're all off. looking over here. It's like, oh. <laughs> it is funny. This. Well, I think that's a great, great point. And I, very, uh, very often I just soon almost for the whole service, leave the sh close up up there on the wide screen because, I, as you say, I can see the wide shot where I'm sitting. Right. I'd like to see the face because it's all in a, a speaker or a singer's eyes, you know. Yep. Now, during during music, I'm more apt to maybe cut a little bit more. Sure. But I think during a speaker, you're exactly right. I don't need to see wide shots. I don't need to see weird side shots. I just want to see the close up that I can't get from my seat. Exactly. All right, now what about doing a signal when you're when you're doing broad? And, um, obviously, we work with a lot of churches that are doing broadcast television, sure. and some do it better than others. Um, what are some of the tips when you're 
multi-camera directing a church service, what would you say to a director out there who's putting together something for television? Well, you, you, you need to have two feeds or two directors. I mean, uh, whoever's doing the, the feed for the either replaying on website or live television right. needs to be free of that worry of the close-up only in the screens. Okay. So if you have two routers that can do that, you can just put the close-up in, not worry so about it. So an iMag feed and then a broadcast TV, live stream, Correct. whatever feed. Correct. Okay. And, and then now you're thinking more like a, a director in a booth. Yeah. You've got people at home. They don't know the situation. They don't know what the room looks like. So you're yeah. going to want to have relationship shots, wide shots. Um, one thing that I think is totally missing in most churches, thing is they don't have any reaction mics. All I you hear totally is the pastor. Agree. That is something that's so brilliant. They don't get that feel of yeah. what's going on. How are people reacting to this and stuff? So that's important. That's an audio cue, not necessarily a multi-camera cue, but it's your director, so you're in charge. Well, of it camera. bugs me when <laughs> the pastor cracks a joke and you don't hear any response, you know, <laughs> exactly. or he, you know, people he encourages people to applaud and you don't hear anything. I mean, hang mics out there. Hang I want to feel the live nature of the room and feel if I'm going to get into it, yeah. I want to hear it. Most churches will take the PA feed. And obviously, yes. obviously you can't do Huge live mistake. mics in a PA feed. That right. would just sound hollow and awesome. But you need to have a separate audio source that can augment that with live audience mics. And I think shots are important, too. I, 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 in many ways, then you tell me if you think I'm crazy, but I believe that audience shots are so critically important, almost as important, this sounds crazy, but almost as important as shots of the pastor or the speaker because the guy at home, first of all, I want to show young, sharp, good-looking people who are attentive. I, you know, the people watching at home, I want them to think, wow, that's a church for me. If all yeah. I show is is old people with no teeth or, you know, people that aren't dressed well, I, I, the guy at home isn't going to think, that's not a church for me. Or right. I want to show a diverse audience. You know, if there's one minority in, in the audience, I'm going to show them because I want to, I want to, you know, project the message that this church is is open and welcome to anyone. Yeah. So I think how you shoot the audience and the audience members that you shoot. I also want to shoot some wide shots because I want people at home to think, hey, a lot of guys go hear this this speaker. No, Maybe I should go hear that speaker too. Yeah. So I think you can use audience shots as a marketing tool in many ways. Oh, that, that's totally true. And you're getting beyond what the message specific to that church yeah. program is to the message of what the church is by showing those kinds of things. Here's what we are. Here's the people that come. And yes. Here's how you interact and how we can interact. And if you come and visit us, this is what you're going to see. So all that's that's vitally important. I agree totally. Does lighting matter to you? Uh, terribly so, yeah. <laughs> I mean, bad lighting directing will really stick out. But when your pastor yeah. walks from light into darkness and stuff, yes. those are obvious things. You know, get a flat look along the set, along the stage. Um, a good room can look really cheap if it's not lit right. Well, that's good. Say that and again. A, a good room. A good room, a, a nice sanctuary yeah. can look really cheap if it's not lit right. And, and to me, the lighting issue is not about ego. It's not about trying to make the pastor a celebrity. It's simply our the camera, our eyes, you know, God made our eye a lot better than a, even our <laughs> modern even day so, camera yeah. cameras are. And so we react to things and see things that the camera can't compute. So you want to enhance the look of that scene so it'll fit a camera. So when it comes across on a television set or online or right. in a live stream, it looks right, I guess. Exactly. It's not, yeah. not trying to dress up the scene, just trying to make it look as best as you possibly yeah, can. Yeah, make it look right. I mean, I've seen some worship where they just totally light all the musicians in red. And, and your, your lead singers out there are flesh tones, and you look like you have demons behind it. <laughs> They're all just shadowy, reddish, kind of dark. And it's like, yeah. That's not probably the best look for the TV part. No, of not at all. And the other point, too, is distractions of the people in the audience. What are you doing with your camera people? Are they running around in oh, the way? Yeah, right. Suddenly your people in worship are going like, oh, what's going on over there? Instead of yeah, not distracting. Good uh, point. Because in worship, sometimes I think our video gets so over the top. Yeah. So many musical cuts and blah, blah, blah. This and so. I used to be a worship leader as well. I still play piano and do guitar and stuff. Never once did I think I wanted these people to watch me yeah. or our band. It's the Holy Spirit. You know, we're trying That's to good. we're trying to you know glorify Jesus here. So, at times, really think about no visuals. Even the words goes away on a real simple worship song. Yeah. Do people need to be looking at words they focus, they know? Focus, focus. It's like if it's real simple and the Holy Spirit's growing into an intimate setting, be sensitive enough to do nothing. Yeah, but, especially if you're in a relatively small room where camera operators will stand out. I, I've been to churches and uh, you know meetings where camera operators talking into his headset really loud or, you know, obviously <laughs> yeah. just walking up and down the aisle. Uh, oh, my gosh. We even experimented 
at one church with having the handheld guy sit on an office in an office chair with wheels on it and roam up and down the aisle because at least he's the level of the audience so he didn't stand out. Nobody <laughs> noticed him. So I'm willing to try anything if it makes them be more invisible. Yeah. I think that's really important. And know how talented your crew is? Yeah. It's like... Um, I have some great A-team professional cameramen who could go underneath a performer and hold a close-up yeah. from their knees. Most volunteer church workers are not going to be able to pull that off and end up with this. Yeah. Your screen looks like, you know, know the limitation. If, if you're multi-camera directing and you've never run camera before, oh, get out there and do that. That's a good idea. Because until you know how to res how, what it takes to respond to what you're directing, you could be asking for stupid things. Yeah. Um, also, directors who are yellers or screamers, mm -hmm. comment about that. I hate them. I, I, as a TD and a cameraman, I worked for great directors and really bad directors. And the screamers would generally lose about eight to ten shots while they're screaming their head off. <laughs> and then they'd finally get calm and we'd yeah. catch up to, to, you know, to, to actually cutting away what you need to be cutting. But it's, there's no, no use for that. For me, I, 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 I believe that when you start screaming, you're telegraphing to the crew that you've just lost control. And that's not what you want to do. <laughs> Which you, want. you have. I mean, well, if, you're, sure. if you're that upset. So I think that's ridiculous. Um, yeah. All right, so let me ask you this. You work at, at, uh, over in a major studio. You work yeah. on the Sony lot. Um, you could work at any church in America as a director. You're a Christian guy. What are you doing in Hollywood? Uh, I, I, I left Oral Roberts University with the, design, the specific design not to work in Christian television. It's funny. That was never my, my heart yeah. and my desire. But the first job that opened up to me was directing for a pastor in Las Vegas. My brother was associate pastor for. And it turned out he was not morally, up yeah. to the challenge of having his ministry spread that way and stuff. So within a couple of months, I was looking for a job, you know, and stuff. But my heart's never been to, I'm, I'm like you, I would love to help people do yeah. that and stuff, but I've always felt called that the Hollywood was my mission field. And it's taken a while to really learn that. Um, matter of fact, you know, I've heard you talk about people who don't really have what it's cut out to be to be in Hollywood, and, and after a yeah. while you realize that and you just leave. Yeah. I don't know if you know that. I was one of those guys. Really? Did you know that? I you, don't think you did. You came here, then left. I did. Um, s career was successful. I was technical directing Arsenio Hall's first show. Yeah, I remember. remember. And it just got so dark. And then we were the first show to let our hosts swear, and then we'd bleep it out and look at where that's gone yeah. since back then and stuff. And I just got fed up. I said, God, I, I don't know if I want this anymore. So my wife and I left, and we went back to Vegas. I went on staff with Greg Massonari, our yes, friend in, in uh -huh. Las Vegas. Did, did church worship and home groups and stuff. Still part-time, and then yeah. still did TV part-time. And through those years is when I started directing the telethon and stuff. So, so uh. I felt I didn't know if I wanted to stay in any longer, but God showed me I'm not a pastor's heart. I don't belong in church. <laughs> I'm with you on that. Get back out into the, the cold, hard darkness of Hollywood and do what yeah. you can. So, so and, and just as a, you know, as an aside, as a Christian working in a secular studio environment, you don't call a lot of attention to yourself as a Christian. I mean, you don't make a big deal about it. You don't carry a flag around. Um, you just live that life. And, and um, I, I think there's a lot of people out there that think either you come to Hollywood, you've got to be, you've got to witness to everybody you see, um, you got to hand out tracks on the set. Um, <laughs> I, I just, it's just not the way. You, you want to win people's trust, first of all, and you want to be a leader. And I think you have to be very careful how you navigate that world. Yeah, I, I've always, um, I'm an author as well. So there's some Christian novels out there that I wrote that are, people know about. So it's yeah. not like I can hide my Christianity. Not that I would try to anyway. Right. But the first tale is, you know, I don't swear when I direct. And, and people notice that right off the bat. Really? There, there's just a handful of directors out there. I may be the only one. Is, I don't know. <laughs> um, that you don't use those words. I just don't use them in real yeah. life. So why would I use yeah. them when I direct? Um, that makes a statement. And then people start, well, what's different about you? Why? And then they start to analyze your life. And we don't talk about it much on set right. or whatever. Politics gets into a play, too, and so I try and leave, leave that alone. But when somebody's in trouble, they will find you. And that's they will say, what, what is going on? Here's what's happening in my life. Can you talk into that and stuff? And that's where God's opened up doors for really ministering to people, talking to them, and loving them. And I'd, I'd a, I have a friend who's a, a director of episodic dramas, cop shows. And he said, you know, he's got like 60 people on his film crew every day. And he said, I never make a big deal about being a Christian. I don't talk about it. But he said, uh, he said the other, he said people like you, exactly like you said, they find their way to me. And he said, one guy the other day came up to me and said, hey, um, 
I need you to do what you that thing you do. And he says, what, what is that What's thing? thing I do? He said, what? He's, that, you mean prayer? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. He said, <laughs> my wife has cancer. We found out yesterday my wife has cancer, and I just need you to do that for me. Would you mind? Yeah. And he said, it's just interesting how many people. And it was uh, without being overt, without make, making it a big deal. I think yeah. that's that's the secret. That's the way to be. I mean, it's, your light is the witness. You don't have to bang people over the head. You know. All right. To be a, multi, a successful multi-camera director, do you have to move to Hollywood? No. New York? Um, I would say in this day and age, multi-camera directing, you're probably going to need to be in a in a in a production hub. Yeah. Um, I think single camera, telling your stories, you can be anywhere you want. Yeah. Um, of course, if you're going to multi-camera direct in a church, you could be anywhere as well. Yeah. You know. Or local good. news, maybe. Local news. It's what what is God calling you to do is the important part. Because okay. Hollywood will eat you up, like you've said before, yeah. if you're not called to be here. You know, I had. Probably, you know, think about your own dreams and your own visions. When I was successfully moving up from camera to TV and stuff, and around 24, 25 years old, I, I made this goal. I said, by the time I'm 30, I want to be a full-time director. I didn't pray about that. I just, that was my goal. Yeah. Let me tell you about my 30th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in some town, I don't even remember where. We were on a country music tour. We would travel across the United States and, yeah. and do country music concerts with IMAC. It's okay. all it was for. We didn't record it for a special or whatever. Actually, Arsenio's director, Sandy, was the director of the show. And I was a TD, and we would go around and do all these things. Well, Sandy stopped doing it, and I thought, this is my chance. There's no AD on this show. You know, normally director, right. when a director retired, whatever, the AD or the TD, most M often the AD in. moves in, not the technical side. This is my chance. This is great. You know, well, no, they hired a cameraman to do it. One uh. of the cameramen, they gave the job of directing. So on my 30th birthday, we're out there doing this show. I'm depressed because I didn't reach my goal. Yeah. I should have talked to God about what his goal was. No but kidding. That's a whole different story. Um, Come and be known. At the end of the last number, the Judds, I don't know if you remember Naomi yeah, and Winona, absolutely. they come in with the birthday cake. I thought, oh, it was the director's birthday too, the exact same day. And they're all, hey, happy birthday day. I go, wow, God, this is, this is good. This is really, really fun. I hit bottom. Yeah, I hit bottom. So, um, But, you know, that was 30 years old. By the time I'm 30, 30, let's say it was 1986. 1987, I got into the director's guild. The door opened up for that. By the time I'm 35... That's I'm, the Director's Guild, which is the union uh, uh, for right. directors. Very, very difficult to break into. <clears throat> yeah, DGA. Um, I was uh, teaching the all-new dating game. The director had a conflict. They asked me to take over. That got me in the guild. So at 30 years old, I was discouraged. But by the time I'm 35, I'm much more mature. I know what the heck I'm doing. I think a whole lot better. Yeah. And now I'm directing Jerry Lewis Telethon, and my director here <laughs> takes off. So it's like... God knew. I didn't. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, I got fired at 36. So it's, <laughs> see, that's what happens. It's up and down world out there. Well, listen, uh, you know, if there's one thing you'd say, if there's one thing you'd say to people out there who are thinking about being a director, a multi-camera, television, broadcast, whatever, even coming, you know, just being a filmmaker, being a creative person in the industry, what would you, what, what is the one thing you'd encourage them with? Know your craft as well as you can. And whatever craft, I mean, you're not going to come out of college and get a job at a major production studio directing, right. whether it's film, multi-camera, whatever. You're going to have to start on the ground floor. So um, look at the track you start on, because sometimes you get really pigeonholed in that track. That's true. If you are doing that, you may not be able to get out of that to get to where you really want to be. So make sure you're on the ground floor of a track that will take you to where you want to be. Um, we, have, we have, you know, Mike Dutton, our friend cameraman yeah. from, from he, he never wanted to do anything but run camera. He's, he's had a doing great career, he's doing all these years, still, you know, still doing it, loving it. Um, if you want to get to a different position, you know, it's like he, technical side was great for me. Yeah. Cameraman, technical director. But I saw a lot of directors get replaced from the production side, not the technical side. OK. The producers, they know. Their AD a lot better than they know their technical director. That person's in the office. Time they're with spending them. time with them, doing all that stuff. So you might be better off doing a production assistant job into booth yeah. PA to AD, or if you're really talented to the technical side, you might be able to come around that direction. Um, but you've got to put your time in and know your stuff before you ever sit in that chair, or you'll get eaten up. That's a good. Yeah. That's a good word. Clay Jacobson, thank you so much for being a part of. And people can go to ClayJacobson.com, right? Yep, S E N. S E N. Clay Jacobson, um, to find out more about what he's doing. We'll put the we'll put it in the notes um, to find out what he's doing and keep up with him. I think that's really important. Thanks for tuning in. Share this with people. There are people at churches and ministry organizations, nonprofits, and even people here in Hollywood that want to pursue a career as a multi-camera television director. And this is this is a great great conversation about how to actually do that.
that and the path he's taken and how it could impact them. So share it. Share it with people and uh, come back and see us at philcook.com, my blog, because that's where all these conversations end up and where they happen. And I um, want to thank you for joining us on this. And uh, we've got some upcoming episodes that I think are going to be really amazing. 